Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the latest broadcast of the Connected Leadership Podcast Live. If you are watching live on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on YouTube, please pop me a message, let me know you're there, uh, and that we've got an audience with us. Um, But what we do here is I record uh, an edition of the Connected Leadership Podcast with my guests, but I do it with you. So if you have any questions or comments on what is being said, I'll feature that in the show as well. And it's just a great way of engaging uh, with people who aren't necessarily going to listen to the podcast live, um, but still want to engage with the content or actually see what I look like with my terrible lockdown hair, which is just getting worse day by day, um, or or what my guests look like in the flesh as well. And it (laughs) seems to be uh, well received so far. Um, So uh, let me tell you a little bit about the guest that I have got on today. Uh, The podcast launched in September of last year. It had been planned for a while uh, and it was actually my third podcast. Um, Previously, I'd had uh, the the Connecting is Not Enough radio show, which was effectively a podcast version of my newsletter um, based on uh, Alan Stevens' Media Coach radio show, which is excellent. Um, But I I guess I didn't really know where I was going with that, so I gave it up after a while. And then for two years, I co-hosted the Global Networking Show with uh, Dr Ivan Meisner, and we brought in guests from all around the world uh, for some really, I thought, some fantastic conversations. And they're, they're all available on YouTube if you want to catch those now Bjorn it's great to see you joining us are you in Sweden at the moment um, I hope that uh, well you're not that locked down in Sweden are you but I hope that you're, you're staying safe and, and you're well um, so so those are my first two podcasts uh, the the, the uh, connecting is not enough radio show and then the global networking show and then I let it lie for a while um, and then I decided that the time was ripe with the uh, the publication of Connected Leadership as a book, which, by the way, has just been shortlisted in the uh, Business Book Awards 2021 as best short book. Um, I decided that I'd, a podcast would be a good fit for this. My network was in a place where I could bring some great guests on board. And around that time... Um, Anna Parker Naples, who's our guest today, um, I'd been a guest on her podcast, so I was getting her emails and I saw that she was running a podcast challenge on Facebook. And I thought, well, let's let's do that. And it will just gear me up to, to, to get this moving. And I did the podcast challenge. And what I found was, although I had been there twice and I knew the basics, there was a lot I didn't know. Or if there was stuff that I knew, but I wasn't putting into practice. And it was a really great discipline to address and professionalize the podcast that I was putting in place. And then I invested in Anna's uh, podcast membership, which I still invest in, which is a brilliant resource if you're looking to, to start your own podcast or even if you just want to accelerate the podcast you already have. So that's the background. Uh, earlier, earlier this year, or perhaps late last year, Anna brought out her book. Uh, It's her second book, actually. uh, But this book is Podcast with Impact, um, features notable quotes on the back cover, including yours truly, um, and is an excellent book. And I think very unlucky not to get (laughs) into the shortlist yet last night Um, uh, and and highly recommended. And you'll see at the top there, it says from the best selling author of Get Visible, uh, which was um, Anna's first book. So we are going to talk about podcasting during this chat for the for, for the podcast, but we're going to talk about visibility um, from a more from a broader perspective. So that's enough of me waffling on. Let you just want to meet Anna, don't you? So she she hasn't got the lockdown hair like mine. So Anna, uh, welcome to the Connected Leadership Podcast. Hey, Andy, that was a lovely introduction and very fancy having my book kind of <laughs> hang up in front of us. Those of you those of you watching rather than just listening. So thank you. I'm really pleased no to be pleasure. here. Well, this is about my fifth or sixth live broadcast of the podcast. And so now I'm playing with all the tools at my disposal and getting a little bit more flashy every time uh, <laughs> that I do it. So uh, <laughs> that that's that's where we go. But I, I'm also, I, if you listen to the podcast, you probably miss all that. That was the intro for everyone watching because I've got to give some bonus material um, for people who join us live as well, haven't I? Thank you very much for joining me. We've been talking about doing this for ages. Uh, and it made sense to get you on. Uh, and I think it's an important topic um, that we're going to talk about today. Um, so I want to focus in on visibility, uh, as I said. Uh, and, you know, there are those of us who 
love visibility and we like putting ourselves out there and you and I are both I think both personality wise we enjoy um, putting our, our, our ideas out there um, but also it's important for our business we are knowledge experts we share our knowledge so visibility is key to both make sure that knowledge gets out as widely as possible but also uh, to get more people to engage with us other leaders may not feel that that's so necessary for them uh, and how 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 do you approach this as a leader if you feel well actually I'm a leader because of my technical abilities and that's what I want to focus on I'm not that interested in promoting my name promoting my brand whether it's internally or externally why should leaders care about their profile well I think this comes down to the whole topic of this podcast and your book the more people you are connected with the more impact you can have And in terms of business, and I I work a lot with solo entrepreneurs, the more people who know about you, the more referrals you can gather, the more uh, recommendations that can happen naturally and organically, the more people can come into your world, follow your work, read your books, listen to your podcast, the more money you can make. And I do think it is as simple as that. But there's, there's lots of reasons why people shy away from visibility. And a lot of this is about a fear of judgment a fear of, well, if I put myself out there, I'm going to be attacked or I'm going to be ridiculed in some way. And actually what we're seeing a a real rise of is leaders coming from a very different place, leaders coming from a, a more vulnerable position and sharing a lot of who they are. And I think that we are actually now particularly particularly because of lockdown and covid we're seeking that connection and that real communication with real people rather than fabricated and manufactured profiles if you like and the more we can share of ourselves the more people are going to respect us understand us feel attracted and drawn to us and really what we're doing with all of this stuff in terms of being an expert author in terms of running podcasts in terms of content that we deliver it's attraction marketing we are trying to magnetize people to want more of us and i think starting to think about leadership in those terms how can i let people know more about me without giving the whole game away how can i let people know more about me so that they trust me more because trust is so important in relationship I think that's an excellent answer and there's a lot to unwrap there and I want to hone in on two different things so let's break Mm -hmm. them up. I'm going to come back to the vulnerability um, piece because that's so important and regular listeners to the podcast and and regular viewers of the stream will know how important that is to me. Um, You know as a topic of my last book it's bang on topic for me Um, but let's come back to that because there were a lot of benefits of visibility in there and I, you know, there are those people who are solopreneurs that you mentioned or or even run their own business, may not be a solopreneur, but run a small business for whom referrals are key. Therefore, visibility is absolutely essential uh, unless you have a phenomenal network um, building referrals for you in a, in a very tight area. But mm. even there, you want visibility within a niche. You know, it doesn't have to be broad visibility. Um, but you talked about um, people wanting more of you. That can apply to someone who has no connection with the sales role in a large organisation. Um, trust and respect. The visibility buys you that trust and respect. And I think that those benefits of visibility go towards promotion. They go towards getting a message across. So let's say you're a finance director in a large organisation and you have to introduce budget cuts then if you have the right profile within the organisation, that's going to dictate whether how smoothly that transition goes, that move goes. Same with if you if the business is going through an acquisition or a merger process, people are worried about their jobs. Mm. How people perceive you is going to influence um, how they receive your message. So what what can people in those positions do who aren't worried about sales, but they've got to get this for themselves how can they change their mindset around that i think it's a in in an organization like that i think it's about how do you harness respect how do you harness respect and some of that comes down to relationship building but also value sharing your values letting people know what you stand for what you represent what matters to you 
And sometimes it's, it's personal stories that really illustrate that. And that's why we're, we're podcasting now. That's why books do so well. Export author books do so well because we share story. That's why podcasts do so well. So in an organisation like that, when you're talking about someone having to deliver some quite painful news... Well, if you come at that with heart and it's not just delivered at that moment where the news has to come, but you've been mindful all the way along of letting letting your colleagues know little bits about you. And I'm not talking about the argument you had with your wife, the dinner that you didn't enjoy. It's not that, but it's about what you represent, what drives you, what, what you're passionate about. Because then what we're doing as human beings, and I'm sure you've covered this before, we always want to find that that, that connection element, what is the same? In what way do I belong to this person? In what way? So, for example, I'm going to just share something really random that's just come into my head. I'm a real buff about World War II. I live not far from Bletchley Park, and Leighton Buzzard has an incredible history, and I, I did a research piece at Bletchley Park as a performer. It fascinates me, and I intend to do something in with that in due course when the time is right. So I had to make a, a call today to an insurance company to try and get some new insurance. And they were going to say no. But somehow we ended up talking about podcasts and he told me he was listening to a World War II specialist podcast. Now, because we then had a random conversation as total strangers in this world, we enjoyed each other's company for, let's say, 10 minutes while we're waiting for processes to go through. And business was done. And I achieved the result I wanted because he felt connected to me. And if, if I had not revealed my interest in what he just told me, we wouldn't have had that connection and that bond. And we wouldn't have got the very smooth uh, result <laughs> to get the process signed, sealed and delivered. And that's what I'm talking about. So how can you share? You know, if, for example maybe you love triathlons and you're in a in a, a work environment environment nine till you'd want it to be five but let's say it's much longer than that every single day of the week well if you do tell people well I'm, I'm actually doing I'm training for this particular event I'm training to do this I love this about triathlons it, you just it's not like you're dumping all of your interests on the table but you're just inviting people a little bit into your world beyond you in front of a laptop and I think that's how we connect and that's how we have that sense of belonging and that's how we build trust. Uh, Peter Stewart's just said on Facebook that he likes World War II stuff too. <laughs> Rudolf Hess was my next door neighbour. Um, <laughs> and, and Peter, if I remember right, is in Aberdeen. And, and uh, I, I, well, there's, there's another interesting story there to pick up on. Um, and actually, remind me off air, but Bletchley Park, straight away I've got someone that you should have on your podcast and have a chat mm. with about that. Um, very, very involved with that. And thank you, Peter, for, for sharing that with us. Um, what you've said just there goes back to... to podcast conversation a couple of weeks ago at the beginning of March um, that I, 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 I had with Luca Signoretti. We, we do a, 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 an episode every month where we look at various elements and Luca was making this point about making a connection on something you have in common, something I talk about a lot as well. Mm. And, and he has an exercise that he runs in his training workshops where he'll get groups of th two people, people in pairs normally together or in threes. And he'll say, just talk for three or four minutes and find out what you've got in common. And you always find something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important, but we've got to put it out there. And what you're doing, I think, in that answer is redefining what we mean by visibility. Mm -hmm. Because when I planned this episode, when I talk about visibility, I'll be honest, in my mind, it is about putting your profile out there, getting more people to know mm -hmm. who you are. But you're enriching that definition. Because it's not necessarily about saying, look at how great I am, look at you know who I am in terms of my job and my role, but actually visibility can just be showing part of yourself. Yes, that's exactly yeah. it. And it's about showing that things don't always come easily for you. And as a mm. leader, I think, and this is going to actually naturally go into a conversation that we, we had off air. As a leader of whatever we're doing, in whatever way we're building our tribe, we kind of feel to some extent that we have to be perfect, that we have to show up as that armor protected warrior where everything goes right and we're going to win no matter what. 
actually what I think leadership really is in this changing world is showing when things have been a challenge or a struggle. And there was a great phrase, and I don't know where it originated from. It was someone's podcast somewhere that you, as a leader, you want to share from, you want to share from the wound. You want to share from the scar, not from the bleeding open wound. Okay. So for Mm. example, I now, I help many very successful entrepreneurs have great, incredible podcasts that reach, you know, hundreds of thousands of people around the world. One particular niche that comes to mind is a friend of mine, Caroline Strawson. Her podcast is called the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Podcast. She's not sharing how you get over narcissistic abuse from the middle of being in it. She's 10 years down the road from when she left that environment. But she's genuinely sharing, these are the emotional things that happened for me. This is what it means and this is what you can learn from it as well. But if you're not willing to share that vulnerability in the first place, how how you felt rock bottom, what it really looked like, then how can people know that you are the same as them when you're looking to lead? So one of the things that comes to mind, and you mentioned it already in the intro, last night I was very excited. I really wanted Podcast with Impact to to reach the finalist stage for the Business Book Awards. And, and I know that Andy this morning saw me do a Facebook Live about how I felt about the fact that I hadn't got through. And I, I did um and ah, shall I share this or shan't I? But I knew that there was a there was actually a block for me about not getting that validation. That for me, sharing that is true leadership. Sharing how I actually felt, not just sharing the shiny bits when I've won. Because I could have just done that. I could have just ignored the whole thing, never mention it again. But if I want to share the shiny badges, the awards I've won, the amazing um, book release results that I get, how well my podcast does, I also want to share when I'm a little bit bruised and battered and when I'm feeling a little bit more vulnerable because for me, that's how people are going to know that I'm a real person. I'm not just a profile. And that humanizes you uh, and it 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 provides that connection point uh, on a much deeper level than you both like running triathlons, not dismissing if you if you yeah. can find interest in common, that's great. Peter's said that he's got a story around um, Bletchley Park. Now you can find each other on my Facebook profile if you don't know each other already, and and, and you, you've got something to pick up on. But when you connect at that level, um, Nicole Posner has just said uh, vulnerability creates connection, and it absolutely does. It creates connection, I think, in two ways. One is when we empathise. Uh, and so we see the human being behind the facade, mm. behind the mask that we wear, the success. And I think what you you achieved that this morning, um, be, you know, having a live broadcast where you say this sucks and I'm in a bad mood about it and I know I shouldn't be. But as someone who has been through that and thinks the same way and mm. would have been in a very grumpy mood in the same um, this is the same circumstances this morning that 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 pro- provided me with a connection and I clicked on your live I don't always because of time but I saw the title came up and I, I knew what it would be about and I was intrigued to hear what you would say because I got it um, and then you shared a very um, open story about it uh, and the, uh, you know as Nicole says vulnerability creates connection you mm-hmm. you talked about the number of times you people need validation on something and, and and I go through that I mean you said sometimes people need five ten times you know yeah. v- validation more specific <laughs> that than that it's actually it's, a, it's an NLP based thing yeah. you either need yeah. one type of val- one time validation three times seven times 14 or 21 times potentially from the same individual yeah. in order to hear that feedback and one of the fascinating things we do in neurolinguistic programming work is say well when you have that 21 times of validation, who does it need to come from in order for you to realize it's true? Very often it's a parent or a teacher who may no longer be with us or would never be the person to give that validation once, let alone 21 times. So the realization is it's got to come from me. I've got to see it for myself first. And I shared with you that I think for me, it's about 56 times for just ours. <laughs> because I, I went through such um, a, a difficult period. This is really embarrassing. 
I am having my home redecorated next week. Dulux have tried to deliver five times and they've turned up now. Can you bear with me a second? I can Sorry. bear with you. <laughs> I did tell them not to come and in. This, but this is real life leadership in the middle of a pandemic. We all know. We all know that this is going to happen. We all know that everyone is working from home. I think it's actually been a really good leveller in many ways. <laughs> but it's so funny. I mean, I keep getting emails from Julux saying they've tried to deliver and you weren't in. And I said, I'm not allowed to go anywhere. What are you talking about? And I said, please don't deliver between two and three today. Guaranteed. <laughs> Yesterday, don't deliver between two and three. They delivered. Well, they tried. Anyway, so let's, let's go back to um what i was saying about um uh, just ask nicole said fascinating i don't know if she's referring to my uh, <laughs> my delivery my paint delivery or, or the vulnerability <laughs> um so um yes yeah, so with just ask so i went through such a difficult journey with getting that book published um i ended up changing publisher because my publisher didn't believe in it uh the when people tell me they enjoy it i wonder what the catch is and i think oh well, they know me because you know, they're just saying it because they know me. And then when people I don't know tell me they enjoy it, well, I just still need a few more people to tell me. So I think that I'm sharing that because that's why what you said really resonated with me this morning. And as Nicole said, that vulnerability creates connection and, and it is in those two ways. Mm. So on this point of uh, visibility uh, and boosting visibility, by having that vulnerability, we create people who we can create engagement with people by creating engagement with people they understand us better and we can achieve um we can achieve more uh in, in terms of our objectives so that vulnerability is absolutely key now the way you got that across um this the, uh this morning was in a facebook live and you do facebook lives from your uh, it was from your car this morning you do did one from your kitchen and you know you do it from from uh, all over the shop um you know i think you were doing it while your kids were tested for covid this morning and mm -hmm. so forth um tell us a little bit more about bringing that personal life you know what i've just done um in terms of answering the door while the paint gets delivered you know sharing that personal side of you in terms of how that creates a connection uh, as well so, I mean, I mentioned this before, what, what, we're, what we're really doing with these social media platforms is we're building attraction marketing. We are literally trying to magnetize us because people feel like they belong with us. They get my story. So me sit, I don't share all of my messy house on camera. There are elements of my, there will be bits no one will ever see because they don't need to see that stuff. But there are parts of my house that I'll share. I'll share that I'm sitting in the car waiting for my daughter because she's got a COVID test because that relate anyone who has a child who's returning will get that anyone who's i don't know not not that i'm necessarily reaching mums but people can see that i have a real life i'm not just somebody who writes expert books i'm not just somebody who has a successful podcast i am a real person living a real life for me personally i think well who am i most inspired by i'm inspired by the people who open the door just a little bit because that gives me hope and inspiration and motivation that I can achieve whatever I need to achieve. And like I said to you before, I mean, I'm sitting here right now in a recording studio that used to be my airing cupboard. <laughs> and that's quite a big part of my journey. Now, I'm happily, I'll happily do lives in here. On my landing out there, there's so much rubbish because we cleared out the kids' bedrooms and I haven't put it in the attic. Am I going to show you that? No. But I can let you know quite happily and comfortably that I'm living a real life and our lives are progressing in whatever way a family's life is progressing. Because somebody else out there might kind of go, well, you know, I've been, my house is a bit of a mess and that doesn't necessarily make me a failure. And so I get what Anna's talking about. And it's the minutia of your life, but not everything you had for dinner. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's weaving that story. I'm very mindful of anything I put out on social media. It's very rare that I haven't thought about how it's either going to inspire somebody, and I don't mean in terms of putting quotes out there, how it's either going to inspire someone or how someone might feel more connected to me. Because that's what we're doing as leaders. We're showing a little element of who we are. And I think that we're incredibly lucky with platforms like LinkedIn, Instagram and, and Facebook 
never mind the podcasting element, that we can do that because we're drip feeding. We're not having to give it all at once. It's over a period of time. And, and there's this, this sort of understanding that the amount of touch points, the amount of times we need to see someone, hear someone, feel someone, experience someone, before we even notice they're there and before we notice what they're about, what they're selling, way before you get to a sale, it's something like 27 to 32 times now. So you can't just be in sales mode. You can't just be in pre mode the whole time you've got to let people in otherwise it's too generic and it's too bland i i've been um i've been running some linkedin workshops for a client recently and it's not something i do regularly but I, but I, I i do occasionally and i've been um i've been encouraging them to move away from when they post which is rare at the moment just making it all about business offerings and I've got a couple of clients that, that that's the you know I can only share the business mm -hmm. stuff and I show them my LinkedIn activity and what I show them is the the posts that are the you know the quotes from the podcast and uh, what I'm up to and I, I, I've stopped saying I'm speaking here and I'm speaking there I think well people don't sit at their desk and say I'm now filling in this document you know that's what I do for a living <laughs> Uh, so it has to add some value. Um, it, it's fine to to share something that, that is celebrating a success, um, and sharing that with my network. Um, but but I try not to do that. You know, everyday stuff. I guess you, you might call it. Um, but I, I showed them how all of these um, posts about my business, even if they're giving hopefully value to my network, three hundred views, two hundred views, eighty views, seventy views. Then there was one of me chopping garlic, um, chilies, uh, and ginger for a curry, and saying, "Isn't it nice that we don't, you know, don't have to check our diary before we make a, a smelly curry midweek now to check what meetings we got the next day?" Two thousand views, just the numbers. Yeah, I immediately want to know what kind of curry it was, Andy. Yeah, yeah. That, because I immediately, I'm, oh, I like curry. <laughs> I make a lot of curries. <laughs> I have an aubergine katsu curry tonight and it's very nice. Uh, Nicole has said there's a subtle difference between sharing warts and all and those moments or situations that can resonate. Uh, and I'd agree with that. And I think the point is that the moments that can resonate don't have to be the big professional moments all the time. And, and and for you, it's it's taking, you know, you, you're showing why your kids are getting tested for COVID. Um, there's a wonderful post on LinkedIn that I reshared. Don't know the person that someone in my my network liked it, which was someone who's very senior woman in a, in, in a big business was just starting a video from her home office to introduce herself and her toddler crawled onto into the screen into shot shared that huge engagement and that yeah, i think yeah so now, when we're, there's, there's sorry, interesting one here. we're talking about talking about children so i don't tend to share photographs of my children now i don't mm. use that as a talking point because as they, they're all kind of in either are already teenager or approaching teenage years yeah. i shared ones when they were little so i don't share everything about my family but i definitely don't pretend that i'm just this professional body that doesn't have have a life going on and it's finding that balance it's finding I think that balance it's, i think it's nice now though you know i i've i've had a call with a very senior banker at one of the big banks uh and she, she did what i did just now and she opened the door to amazon mid call and then her dog got up on her lap i i had a call with another senior uh, woman in business recently and i said are you sitting on bunk beds and she said yes i'm, ho <laughs> I'm homeschooling and she said my daughter wants to say hello you know, and, and I like that because I think you get to know the the, 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 the the personality. And what I like about this conversation is obviously I, I come into these podcasts with an idea of what I want to chat about, but I'm happy to see where it goes. Mm. And it comes back again to that redefining, boosting your visibility. And it's over the last year, it's moving away from, you know, making sure people know me and what I stand for and what I do, which is important. Mm. But that, but the probably more important, making sure people know me. Yeah. And what curry you like. And what curry I like. And the there's answer actually, is most. There's actually a post that I shared this week, Andy, which I think is really pertinent to what we're discussing. I I was attacked um, by a gang of girls when I was 16. And I was 
you're brutally attacked and I had to have plastic surgery on my face and all sorts of things. And what I didn't know at the time, obviously it was traumatic. What I didn't know was that what that had done to me as a young adult and going into my early adulthood as an actor, until many, many years later when I became disabled and I then encountered NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Now, obviously there's a big story there that I'm making very, I'm trying to tell very fast. But I realized through some of this deep work that actually the reason I wasn't having success in my acting career was because I wasn't being honest with myself about who I was and what I really wanted. And so in my book, Get Visible, and we talk about this on my podcast quite a lot as well, is that in order to have any level of success, you have to see and get visible for yourself, your own potential. And then when you really do acknowledge and see your own potential, then you can do whatever you like. Then you can build a profile fairly fearlessly because you know it's in you. But for me, I realized that that event when I was 16 had, had my subconscious had made me kind of push myself back. I'd started hiding and it was unraveling that that made me see, oh, Anna, you've and the success you haven't yet had is because you made that happen. You did that, not the event, What, how you channeled that for yourself. Now, I'm really conscious that, you know, 10 years on since I had that light bulb moment, if I don't share that story about why I think you can achieve anything when you put yourself out there, if I don't share that, then no one can connect to where I've come from. And so I, I, I periodically I will share elements of what happened to me that day and what happened to me consequently. And the amount of people who then reach out to me who I do not know, I don't know them on LinkedIn, I don't know them on Facebook, they will reach out and go, oh, I saw myself in something that you said and it was this sentence that resonated with me. And that feeling of belonging and connection to our past struggles, our past challenges, our past trauma trauma in the widest sense of the word uh, in terms of the way we have felt bruised and battered through things that have happened to us that's actually how we inspire people this happened to me and it's not stopped me i've moved forward and so you can too and i think the more we do that as leaders it comes from that place of i'm deliberately sharing curated parts of myself so that I can move you along too. Well, for me, that's real leadership. There's, there's, a, there's a more fundamental part to it as well. I thoroughly agree with everything you've said. And, and in fact, uh, I was recently interviewed for the Real Leaders podcast in the States where I, I, you know, I, I talked about the, the, the importance of sharing your own vulnerability and how um, with my Just Ask talk, I was originally getting a great response, but I mentioned Alan Stevens, I think, earlier. Um, Alan said to me, you're telling everyone else's story, but not your own. And since I put my own in there, the response is even stronger. Um, but more fundamentally than that, you said, I think, very early on, you, you referenced how some people aren't comfortable with sharing and, and putting mm -hmm. themselves out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm noting noticing a pattern in, in, in what you share because you're you're live this morning uh, was about how something that happened to you when you were seven or eight impacted your response to not being shortlisted in the Business Book Awards this year. Now you're sharing how something that happened to you when you were a bit older has impacted you further on in your career. So mm -hmm. there's obviously, there's something about if you're going to be comfortable sharing your true self or if you're going to be comfortable just putting yourself out there, even if it's not opening up to full vulnerability to others right now, you need to be comfortable um, that it's OK for you to do that. And what's stopping you could be something that's happened to you in the past. For sure. I, I come from a NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and all of that mindset work has changed my life in, on, in, on so many occasions in so many different ways. And it's about really seeing that the limitations and those fears and those blocks were things that I imposed on myself. So many people, when they think about getting visible, they think, well, I can't possibly because my mum might not like that. Or actually, it's very often a sibling or 
a sibling in law that they worry about the most or someone who bullied them when they were at school when they were pre 15 years of uh, years of age and i think that that's a shame and i think that's a shame because that's what was happening for me for a very long time and it took me reaching the most awful horrendous point of my life to realize i was so unhappy i had to do something about it and i, I guess my decision to step into leadership is that if i want people to step up and change their own lives in some way i have to show you that my life wasn't like it is now and i also think that i feel very strongly that i'm still right at the beginning of my journey i've been in this motivational space i suppose for about four years i'm still right at the beginning because i plan to do this for the rest of my life who knows what will happen, but that's my plan. So I want to make sure that I'm taking people on that journey, right? This hasn't all happened. The the books, the podcasts, the business that I now have hasn't happened just because I've decided. It's happened because I've had to overcome some quite significant personal business and financial challenges to to get where I am now. And where I'm going, I'm going to have more of them. So... I kind of gone a bit off the point here, but it's about it's about letting people in on the journey, whatever that's like. Whether you're corporate, whether you are, uh, whether whether you're not, whether you're in the more motivational space or whoever you're speaking to, let people in. Don't be so afraid. And I I, I think I used to come at. You know, I'm a very a very ambitious and quite competitive woman, but I'm ambitious for myself. But I never want people to think that it's always easy for those of us who achieve success. It isn't. We're often doing that deeper work. We're often doing it. And that's how we get where we want to go. And I think you're doing extraordinarily well. I mean, four years in, I'm 18 years in, if you want um, uh, a reference point and um, maybe more, you know, because it wasn't a straight uh, a straight start. Um, Four years in, you're doing very well. the point (laughs) i think we've gone way off the point of the podcast but i don't mind because i think it's been a fascinating conversation um but but there is that wherever you're at you you might not want to be a motivational speaker you might not want to write books and so forth um but if you can take an ounce of what anna's talking about uh and understand what's stopping you from sharing and from opening up then you'll see how um you know you can really get your your message out there and you can you can impact the change that you want to do because whatever role you're in you want to see results and you rely on other people to get the results that's the whole premise of this podcast Mm -hmm. the professional relationships underpin executive success and and the whole point of this conversation as it has evolved is that by engaging with people you're getting that that those relationships and by getting those relationships you get that response nicole's come back in and said being visible means being vulnerable um and and that goes very much to that point and and thank you nicole for 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 contributing if anyone else is listening on facebook linkedin youtube do feel free to to ask any questions or to to add to the conversation i do feel having said we've gone off topic but i don't mind i do feel it would be criminal for me to have you on here and not talk about podcasts um (laughs) and so with with time in mind i would like to spend the rest of the time perhaps talking a little bit more about podcasts so so I see podcasts almost as the new website. Everyone seems to need to have one and and it's becoming a very crowded market now. And in fact, you know, when I I joined your Facebook challenge and and, and the podcast membership, it's a point that you make. It's it's, it's, it's an extremely fast growing uh, market. It makes sense why you or I would have a podcast. And I guess this is a mirror of, of my earlier question. Why would a leader or an emerging leader inside a large organization you know, get involved in that world why should they care so podcasting as you say is still in its infancy within the next three years it's going to be the case that every business is going to be expected to have a podcast uh, in the same way that suddenly however many years ago 12 years ago if you didn't have a blog what was even the point of your website and so right now because it's in its infancy you could have a podcast that demonstrates leadership within your industry not just you in your business 
but within your industry you can connect with people you can position yourself very powerfully at launch right from the word go even with quite a small following if you get the launch strategy right you can through having a podcast as you do andy i know bring in incredible people that you want to develop relationships with never mind the listener who do you want to to have as your peer and and that becomes really powerful now if you aren't someone who wants to be fiercely visible for whatever reason a podcast is actually a kind of soft way into doing that because you as the host one don't have to be on camera you don't have to be live streaming like we are now it can be you in your office in the corner of your building wherever you are at home and the microphone and better yet you can actually bring on guests who do the majority of the legwork for you yes you're there to facilitate questions but it's not you who actually has to provide all of the content and when we're looking at visibility for podcasts not only do podcasts allow you visibility within the podcast directories themselves they allow you um, to increase your ranking within google um, no matter where your podcast is positioned it can help your google ranking for your website we all know how powerful that is i'm not going to go into that but google podcasts launched last april april 2020 and they now have the ability to read every single podcast content even if it's never transcribed anywhere so if you are I can't even think of a, a, a kind of more corporate version, but if you are the person in your industry who, who deals with such and such in finance, I don't know, I'm not corporate, but you, let's take a, a, t a particular topic that you know you want to stand out for in your field, but for your whole business, not just you. Well, the more podcast episodes that you are either a guest on or you are hosting a podcast about, the more it's going to improve your entire visibility for your business in, because of Google. The other thing is the partnerships and collaborations that start on podcasts. When else do you get to have up to an hour with somebody having a great conversation like we are now? Um, and also the extra social media content that can come from a podcast interview. Uh, so, I mean, I see people's businesses go from just right at the start to accelerating in a very short window because they get their podcast strategy right for example we launched someone a couple of weeks ago who like you were talking about she was very connected had no social media presence whatsoever at all at the start of lockdown suddenly a lot of her business was removed because she couldn't get to the far east where her her people and connections were but as a result of launching a podcast, she's now been connected with some very, very high level corporate people who want to bring her in to work with them. A TV producer, um, people who want to work with her one on one privately all across the board in lots of different industries because she got more visible. Now, that's powerful. It's incredibly powerful. And I think that um, it doesn't have to be about being a celebrity. It doesn't have to be about being the number one person in your industry. Because a lot of people, that's not within their remit to do so. Um, but a couple of, uh, of things that you, you said that I want to pick up on. Number one, you don't have to have your own. Just go out there and be a guest on as many podcasts yeah. as possible. And I was doing a lot of that in between podcasts. Uh, and with, with two books published last year, of course, it, it's very it's a great way to get the message out i i am i'm being interviewed often three or four times a week uh for podcasts and it's really building my my profile outside the uk as well which makes mm. a big big difference um and and then this this whole point about getting time with people um it's a great follow-up when you meet someone really interesting and you think how can i take that to the next level mm. you turn around to anyone and say would you like to be on my podcast that appeals to them um and you you you, you escalate the, the connection very quickly and i've you know regular listeners to the connected leadership podcast will know the level of guests i've had many of whom i've known quite well yeah. many of whom i've met once or twice we've 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 had a rapport it hasn't been cold um and i want to know we've got that rapport so i know they're going to be a good guest on the podcast as well yeah, sure. um but since since having that hour with them 
um, it's made a big difference. We've stayed in touch and it's not just the hour. It's then when we put it out there and we're engaging on social about the podcast and so on. Uh, you know, I, I share very often and I've shared on this podcast a technique called 24 seven thirty. And 24 seven thirty is how you get people you want to meet them into your network and staying there. And it's following up within 24 hours, seven days and 30 days. So it's you mentioned touch points earlier. It's three mm. two way touch points in a short period of time. A podcast gives you tremendously powerful connection and interactions that will deepen a relationship in an accelerated way. So I think that's a key thing as, as well. And I think, I think to highlight that, Andy, I put a call out. I'd, I'd had a series of really great, incredible female mm. guests. But I, I wanted to expand my connections with with men because I was moving from um, a business model that served just women to to not. And yours was one of the names that came up. Now, I didn't know you. I did a bit of a Google stalk and found out actually this would be someone good. We met. We got on. We don't have to be best buddies, but we're in each other's worlds. I kind of I've been watching and supporting your book launches. You've, you've been featured in my book. And we can pass referrals to each other, whether it's you don't know, but people I send to your books who then come into your world and, and vice versa. Now, had we not had that very first conversation on my podcast, the conversation before we recorded, the conversation in the, in the episode and then the conversation afterwards, those things would never have happened. And I think that, I mean, your, your connected leadership idea is, is a really about communication and relationship well actually i kind of feel that that's what podcasting and podcast guesting is on steroids now it doesn't mean everyone that you have on your on your show is going to become the best person to do a joint venture with or collaborate with it doesn't always work that way but i would say probably eight times out of ten the relationship develops somewhere down the line because you feel like you've got a connection and it also helps you reconnect with people that you haven't had that purpose to as well, which makes a difference. We've got about five minutes left. So I think just to finish off, um, let's not let, let leave people hanging. I've mentioned your, your Facebook challenge. I've mentioned your podcast membership, which I, I, I highly recommend. And I, I push people towards it on a regular basis. Um, top tips for people who, who want to find out more about the world of podcasting and, and want to get started. And obviously there's your book as well, but just more generically um so, i'm gonna take all the promo away from you and i'll do that for you just your top tips i would say don't hang about with this it's going to get harder within the next 12 months to put this in context in november 2019 there were 850,000 podcasts in the in the whole world across every language every category Fast forward now, and we're recording this at the very beginning of March 2021. And there are now, we're about to cross over the 2 million podcasts live worldwide. And that is shows, not episodes. So the growth is phenomenal. And this accelerated because of lockdown, and it is not going to ease up. It's going to grow and grow and grow. So if you have an inkling in you that to build your visibility, build your profile, build your connections, that this might be something that you're interested in, please don't wait. Because right now, it is not unrealistic if you follow the right strategies that you could have a chart-topping show in your category in any country around the world. That is totally feasible. But that you've got to you've got to be very clear about who you're trying to reach and why you want it to work for your business so that it's not one of the things that I see people doing is they start a podcast but haven't really thought about how it really fits with the rest of what they're doing so you've got to be clear how am I taking the listeners of that podcast into the rest of my world what are my offers do my offers actually fit with the audience I'm trying to reach? So that when you put your show out, everything has been keyword and search engine optimized so that those people can find you organically. And when you when you allow yourself to do that groundwork, you will have much more success with your podcast. Great advice, Anna. We're going to come back and talk about professional relationships and the role they've played in your career. But for the moment, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, don't run away, everyone. We're going to go straight into recording the follow-up podcast. So for those of you who, who 
uh, who don't know the Connected Leadership podcast, what we do is we record an interview along the lines of the one you've just heard. Uh, Peter, thank you. Peter says great stuff. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hang around. There's going to be more. Uh, and then that goes out on the Monday. This goes out, I think, in a week or so, Monday week. I think this will go out uh, off the top of my head. Uh, and then on the Thursday, there's a roughly 15 minute uh, bonus episode where we have three set questions that, that I'm about to ask Anna. So again, Nicole and Peter, really appreciate your engagement. Anyone else tuning in, do feel free to give us some feedback, your thoughts, add to the conversation uh, and ask questions. And if I have some time as we go through this this follow up episode, I will uh, I'll ask those as well. You're OK for time, Anna, for us to do I'm, this, this episode. I'm fri- I don't really work Fridays. I've just turned up <laughs> to today, Andy. <laughs> is it Friday today? I've lost track. <laughs> and I have to... it's the last day of lockdown homeschooling. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. I, I have I have a weekend of clearing my kitchen and lounge so they can be decorated. Oh, so I, th- I think I'm trying to extend Friday as, as far colour? as I can. I, I want to know is, what colour is your Dulux oh. paint? Dove slate. And then oh, there'll nice. be a white. So there, there's going for neutrals yeah. on the walls so I can go for colourful furniture. So my niece is taking an interior decorating course. She's a stage wow. manager, so she hasn't been working. Oh, so she's been doing interior decorating. So she's in charge. She just tells Amazing. me what to do. I'm not interested. <laughs> I love a grey and a I'm white. Terrible. That's it. There we go. That's <laughs> perfect. Uh, it's the kitchen I'm excited about because I make so many curries in there. Right. Let's get let's get on with with the, the second podcast because uh, you know I, I'm aware of your time and you want to enjoy your Friday afternoon. Um, <laughs> So there'll be three questions um, uh, and we'll just run through those and we'll just see where the conversation takes us as well. So the first question I always ask is what role of professional relationships played in your career to date? Massive, a massive amount. In terms of what I do now, I think it's the masterminds that I've been in with people who I greatly admire that then become friends and we pass referrals on to each other. We pass recommendations on to each other. We're there when the chips are down uh, and the mindset piece that goes with that. The other thing that I would say about professional relationships is that, and this goes back to when in my voice acting career, I decided that I wanted to be at the top of my game. If I was going to do that, I wanted to be hugely successful and in America because you could earn more money, even though I was in the UK. And for that, it was about deliberately cultivating the relationships I wanted to have. How do you get to the top of your industry? Well, the way you do it is by making sure you know the people who are already there. How do you get yourself into their world? And it's not as hard as people think, not at all. And actually what I was going to, an addendum to that is these days getting people on your podcast is the way you can do it quicker. <laughs> I... Um... You, you you remind me of when I published and death came third. I think it was when we originally published it back in 2006. Uh, I got a letter. It must be in 2006 because it was a letter. Uh, and it was from a, an actress and never had actors and actresses in mind when I wrote the book. But she said, my flatmate gets um, gets gets job after job without even having to audition. I can't get the audition. And she'd bought she'd bought and death came third, which was networking skills and presentation mm-hmm. skills, um, in order to um, to to learn how to get those connections, so she could bypass the audition process, um, which is very much what we do in business. We get referrals so that we don't have to do the beauty parades uh, in mm-hmm. terms of winning the business. I, I was also delighted that you mentioned masterminding, um, oh. and Nicole Nicole said masterminds are fantastic, particularly hey, yours. So we, we clearly have a fan here. Um, uh, I, I'm a big big fan of masterminds it's one of the things that I teach um, and I talk about a lot Um, if you haven't come across the concept of masterminding um, reach out to me and let me know I have a tips book on how to start a mastermind and I'm happy to send you uh, a copy of that Um, but but it's masterminds are peer group mentoring effectively and it's support and accountability group problem solving holding each other's feet to the fire um, that really takes you out of the working in the business and helps you to work on the business. It makes such a huge difference. And it's a refreshing answer. It's really interesting. I, I don't ask for anything specific with that question. Most of the time, the responses are individuals and their stories and they're lovely. Um, but I think it's also great to have some something a little bit more strategic 
in that sense and you know both use, responses were quite strategic i use uh, masterminds very strategically who mm. do i want in my circle who has the connections with the people i want as my clients yeah and the first mastermind i did actually uh which felt like such a stretch financially often there is quite a financial for a high level mastermind quite a financial uh input but had i not done that had i not made that decision to play at that level i often talk about playing at a certain level mm. then i would not have the success now because what i was paying for was everybody else's knowledge yeah and, and i i mean I was introduced to masterminds by the Professional Speaking Association, which I know that you've now yeah. become a part of. Uh, and for many years, my masterminds were always fellow speakers. And I have a very powerful mastermind of some fantastic speakers uh, at the moment. But at, at one point, about two or three years ago, I decided that wasn't working for me. It wasn't what I needed at that point. And I set up a separate mastermind, which is also still operational. Um, which at the moment is three very senior people in learning and development roles. And they're in global companies at very high mm. levels. They're my clients. And they are, they're not specifically my clients, these three, uh, although one has been, um, but they are, they represent my clients and they allow mm. me that access to the client mindset. And, and so thinking about exactly what support you need make such a difference and that took me down a slightly different path to many many of my peers so mm -hmm. masterminds are absolutely brilliant so okay so that's great you're very strategic you're very thoughtful about how you build the relationships and where you build the relationships who with doesn't always go right the right way no does it? you can't plan um, for everything <laughs> you can be intentional yeah. but you can't plan for everything absolutely so where has it gone wrong where have relationships gone wrong for you and what have you learned from it we like the horror stories but we want to learn from them as well in terms of business or in terms of any relationship? I think business, professional relationships okay. is, is our focus. So I've had challenges with team where I thought that we got on very well and I potentially didn't step into leadership early enough to guide and nurture. Mm. Uh, that was challenging. And I've also had clients where in the work that I do with with quite a lot of startup entrepreneurs in this online space, um, Sometimes because people feel very drawn to my story, they think that we are friends beyond the client relationship. That can be challenging. And there is a line, there is a line. But if I'm serving someone, if someone is my client, I have to, I have to be in the client role. And that sometimes, that sometimes can be a challenge. Where, where do, when there's paid services happening, where's the line? And I think I've got much better at, uh, setting boundaries for myself um, in that respect and also I love what I do and what I'm doing is helping people release their potential professionally but often it starts with with that inner piece of how you feel about yourself and so I find it very challenging when I get feedback that is not positive because I put everything in and what I've come to understand is that you can't please everybody all you can know is that you believe you're going to bed having done all you can. You cannot please everybody all of the time. And when we talk about that validation piece, I had a client about 18 months ago who there was stuff going on in her life, but she was pretty vindictive to me in a series of emails that I was flabbergasted by. And it was about my style of delivery inside a group program. And I found it very challenging to continue to show up in that environment. And so I saw, I did actually seek the validation because I'm delivering and it's my business. I sought the validation by asking clever, careful questions of the other participants. And I came to understand it, was, it wasn't to do with me. It was to do with what was going on in their world. Didn't mean that I didn't do some processing. So in that relationship, the learnings for me were... If I feel emotionally upset by somebody's response, what's it triggering? So like last night when we're talking yeah. about the book awards, why am I upset? What's going on here? What's the past story? And many of my past stories go back to a fear of rejection and not belonging, which happened for me at that moment I mentioned when I was attacked at 16. So what's the story? What's my subconscious 
putting in blocks for me why am i feeling this level of emotion about it what's the learning and how can i learn it as quickly as possible so that i can move on for, for those of you listening to the the podcast on the thursday um the stories that anna's mentioned are in our monday interview so our full interview so go away and listen to that as well so there's some <laughs> really fascinating stories in there um i think that <laughs> In terms of the the, the the critical feedback that we all get, um, there are many lessons that we can draw from that and many ways that we can address that. You've, you've mentioned one, which is to recognise very often, particularly when the feedback is not constructive, uh, that it's often not about you, it's about them. Uh, and to be able to, to understand that and to distance yourself from the emotions that the negative feedback naturally engender. Um, and the second is to, 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 you mentioned processing, and I think it's really important to be able to process any feedback we get and say, is there anything there that I think is valid that I agree with? Yeah. Uh, and then decide on your response from, from there. But what I want to go back to is, is um, where are your boundaries when people start seeing it as a friendship? Because I have a model of the seven stages of professional relationship. Stage seven is friend. And that's when you go into a personal network. And actually, some of my best friends have come from my mm -hmm. professional network. There are times and, and I, I have clients that I get on extremely well with now. Yeah. Um, and you have to remind yourself just what you said. They're a client and they're paying me. And so there is a line there. How do you set those boundaries now? How do you approach that? Well, in fact, I've just had a, a very old friend of mine just finish up in one of my masterminds. I've known him a very, very long time in a very different career and space. And I spoke to her, you know, on our discovery call, our sales call, if you like, and said, look, when we when we work together in this capacity, I'm going to guide you as your mentor. I'm not going to guide you as your friend. It will always come from love because my work comes from that that aspect anyway. But this is how I'm going to show up for you. And this is how I'd like you to show up. And so I'm actually verbally and physically because it's non-verbal communication as well flagging up that this has to happen it's in the contract anyway but i think it is important to address that and i always come come to that from a place of you are paying me because you respect me i want you to leave this relationship this relieve the working relationship with our friendship still intact so if i'm not up front with you about how i will behave in certain environments and, and where we draw the line then then how can we expect a positive result and so for this for me this might be well if we're going to communicate for example around a mastermind if you have a particular question about that i'm not going to discuss it with you in let's say facebook messenger i will discuss that either via email or i will discuss it in the allotted facebook community if we're having banter as friends and it's about your children or something that's happened that your husband's done we'll use Facebook Messenger and we'll go back to that will be our private space. And I've become better at that as I've become more experienced at working with, you know, I'm often, a lot of the work I'm doing is about helping people unravel who they are and what they want to show. So it's very personal. It's quite deep sometimes. Um, and, and I want people to feel that they trust me, know me, like me. That's not a game. That's real. But when we have a professional relationship where they are paying me for my knowledge and expertise, I want to show up with integrity and do the best I can. And I can only do that if we know what those boundaries are. I think that's a great answer. And last week we had Rebecca Seal uh, as the guest who, who's written a excellent book, Solo. Also missed out, sadly, last night. Um, and in that, so, so Rebecca's book is subtitled how to work from home without losing your mind and one of the things she talked about is where she and her husband both found themselves working from home they had to set exactly the sort of boundaries that that, that you talked about uh, Nicole has said that's so important to address at the start and to be clear about how it's going to work you don't want to be trying to put a bandage on it after um, damage has been done you, you need to be setting that those boundaries initially finally um, now, I normally ask people to recommend books, podcasts, TED Talks, whatever <laughs> they like. I'm guessing you want to recommend podcasts, but you're an author as well. Um, what resources have really stood out for you and been really helpful for you in your journey? One of the most in impactful books for me 
is called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And I, it was my first taste of, my first taste of self-help many, many, many years ago. I was probably age 21, 22. And there are so many exercises in there that I now use with my clients. How you journal to understand what's going on for you. How when you reach a block, you can step away and allow yourself to expand rather than just ignoring the whole thing. I really, really love that book. For anyone who feels that there's something creative in them that isn't getting out there, it's a great book. And when you tap into it and you, you it's this 12 week process, it can unravel all sorts of things for you about what you're not bringing to your life, not just your business. Um, it's originally aimed at writers and actors and musicians, but there's a lot to bring to the business world as well. Um, another book that has made a big impact in me, I was thinking about this today, is Mel Robbins. Is it Mel Robbins? The five second rule. The five second rule. Now, I'm an action taker and I get things done very fast. But even I have so many ideas that I don't action. I should contact that person. I should do that. Oh, no, I'll do it later. And in fact, just yesterday, I was watching a YouTube video by a guy called David Meltzer. And he was saying that the quicker you can make your decisions and take action on them, the more success you're going to have overall, whatever success looks like for you. And the five second rule did things like make me get out of bed to start exercising when the last thing I wanted to do was exercise. I'm not currently doing that one, but you get my point. <laughs> it's still I'm not the same. I'm giving myself until the children go back to school. So I've got the countdown is on. The, the five second rule, if you think I really ought to contact that person, well, you're going to act on it. You're going to just do that. You'll send that voice note. You'll send that WhatsApp, whatever it is, because actually some miraculous things can happen when you reach out to people, whether you believe it or action or just that you are taking action. Um, so I think that, that realizing that we can actually think about taking action and do more of it to get more of what we want, uh, that was a big turning point for me. Um, and then actually I'm going to say just writing my own books for anyone who's not done this, but feels like they've got something in them. I sat and thought about both of my, the first book particularly felt like such a big hurdle to get that first one written. I'd actually thought about the content of that for about six years, but couldn't quite sit down. I couldn't quite do it. And in the end, I just gave myself such a firm deadline that I was personally not going to miss. And it was actually for me, my 40, 40th birthday. I missed that. I didn't get it done. And then it was going to be my 41st. I didn't get it done. And then it was going to be my 42nd. And I launched it two days before my 42nd birthday. But if I hadn't had that in place and I hadn't had in my diary when I'm going to carve the time out to do the first draft and give myself a deadline, and when it's going to come back, you know, when I want the editor to have it back with me, it would never have happened. And I think we can push these things further back, further back. It, it'll happen someday, but nothing happens someday. It happens because you make it happen and you commit to making it happen. It's the same with podcasts. It's the same with, well, you've written many books, Andy. In comparison, I'm just getting going. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you do you do need deadlines. Um, deadlines drive what I do, but I think also um, the, the process of doing it, even if you just do it for yourself, it shapes your thoughts, and that makes a huge difference as well. Um, I, books are like buses with me. Um, I'll write two in a year, and then nothing will happen for five or six or nine. <laughs> so <laughs> we've got a while to wait yet. Then we, we might be a while to wait. I've sort of said I might. Uh, I'm thinking about doing one a bit sooner. Maybe I should set a deadline, but I'm not ready to just yet. I've got some other things uh, to get moving first of all. Uh, Anna, um, really appreciated your time. Um, some some great resources there as well. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, pleasure. Thank you for having me and let, having this wonderful chat that's gone all around the houses. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, before I let you go, that was just to close off the, the recording. Uh, Peter, uh, we'd already moved on to the resources question, but Peter asked, do you write out terms and conditions? So I thought Peter's been with us from the very beginning. Obviously, a, a busy Friday afternoon, Peter. <laughs> uh, this is yeah, Rudolf Hess's next door neighbour. So, um, Peter. I think standard anyway. Um mm in anything but when i was starting out in business i wasn't getting it contractually agreed with any clients i was just kind of 
right at the beginning, just so grateful someone wanted to work with me. You only need to be stung once to realise that you should have invested in getting proper legal terms and conditions done up front. So for me, I wouldn't put anything additional in the terms and conditions if I was working with someone I have a past personal relationship with because it's already all there. What I would just be doing is flagging up for our individual personal relationship. This is how we're going to move forward. And in, going back to sort of that mastermind um, arrangement where I've, I've, and this does happen to me quite often, I've got someone I know in a different way. I won't keep that a secret from the rest of the group. I'll actually be really open from that and say, you know, we know each other from a dis- different capacity. So if I say something in this professional space that relates that that's why, but in this space, you are all equal so that everybody in the room knows that one person isn't getting pre- preferential treatment. I think that's important too. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Peter and Nicole, thank you very much for your contributions as well. There's uh, Anna's book back on screen as well, in case you want to pick that up and get your podcast started. And as I say, check out the Facebook challenge, check out the podcast membership, um, check out Get Visible as well, uh, Anna's other book. Um, whether you con- whether you contributed a question or a comment or not, I really appreciate you joining and I hope that you've enjoyed this. If you're watching on playback as well, please leave a note in the comments. Let us know that you enjoyed it and, and what you got from it and keep the discussion going. Uh, Tuesday morning, I believe it's 10 a.m. Uh, GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. That's off the top of my head. I'm interviewing Nick Johnson um, from Singapore. Nick has had quite a tumultuous um, journey um, uh, as a senior executive from Sweden working in Asia and he's about to publish a book on executive loneliness which ties in a lot with Just Ask in fact I think I mentioned it in Just Ask as well and I've written the forward to this book uh, and he's my next interview um, for the Connected Leadership Podcast. Uh, Peter and, and Nicole, thanks for your additional comments. I'm glad you've enjoyed it. Uh, come and join us uh, on Tuesday morning for some more great conversation. And thank you again to Anna. Uh, I'll see you again soon on the Connected Leadership Podcast.